Good morning to all of you, and uh, thank you for your warm welcome. Look, they cannot jump high or laugh, la laugh long when they are whirling, and the moon and the stars become sad when their tender light is used for night wars. So wrote the poet Hafez in the 14th century about the authority of forgiveness when lovers are whirling. And what a lovely alternative uh, the word whirling is to spat. Wouldn't it be better to say to our partners, we don't fight, darling, we whirl. So Hafez addresses his lines to those unwilling to let go, those, if the logic were to be stretched further, willing to breach what uh, Tolstoy later called in his celebrated letters to Gandhi, the law of love. And for what? For, one presumes, the selfishness that is me, my pain, my suffering, my self-pity. Is that not what we see across the Middle East now, in Israel, in many Arab capitals, and on US campuses, even here at UCLA. If my people are threatened or attacked, I wail, where is the rest of the world? Why are you not with us? Why are you not standing by us, defending us? Would I also not be right to plead for it, justified in doing so? Of course I would be, of course. And yet, could it not also be asked of me, where were you when in other times and in other places, when people suffered and wailed in the same way? Where were you? Forgive me for saying this, but I did not see the people of the Middle East, Arab or Israeli, Christian, Muslim or Jew, take to the streets in large numbers when the people of Yemen were in pain, or the people of Syria, or the people of Tigray, or the Rohingya. And the story is as familiar as the list is tragically long. It is therefore about me, or us, in the restricted sense. The pain is tribal, or we have tribalized it. Our grievance, our fear, and across the street of it, so to speak, our uniqueness, or in language representing an adjacent, more negative feeling, our privileges, or our fear of losing them, are all too obvious through and through. Oh, so sorry. I didn't know you were there. I didn't see you. I do not see you. Is that not, not, is that not how we regard what's happening in El Fasher in Sudan? in eastern Ukraine, and even more in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, as we heard a little while ago from Denis. Selfishness and greed feature in all of us, in some quantity. But in a few of us, they seem to define all that's within, to the point of being unconquerable. When those few individuals pull in the same direction and are in positions of influence, they create a certainty. Booms and busts, with the seeds of the future busts gathering as soon as the boom begins, exploiting the boom, feeding on it until we have the next bust. Only, I'm not speaking of economic or financial cycles, but political ones, and the consequences of the busts are ultimately far more serious. I'd like to think of them as compressions, the steady accretion of all those social and political pressures fed by those who profit both financially and politically from them. And then a decompression, a horrific explosion, a paroxysm of hatred and violence, which uh, not just comes as a result of it, but ends it, leaving in tow the grieving millions wounded in every way, numb 
bewildered by the ferocity of it all. And then an offspring, which is beautiful. Peace, us being good again, a peace that is innocent, one that ought to last, such is the cruelty of war, assuming something has been learned by everyone. Well, alas, our stupidity will not uh, be so easily outdone by our reason, and the most stupid of us will once again seek to profit from peace by undermining it, seize on its weaknesses, and double down on division. The tensions build, the rules fade away, and the welcome mat is rolled out for the coming anarchy. Oh, we haven't seen you for a while. Please come in. Horrible. Let me demonstrate this simply by looking at the West in the last 30 years, and forgive me for summarizing it uh, like this. But to begin with, I would like to travel to Hyde Park in New York State and to the home and museum of FDR and Eleanor Roosevelt. There, you will see an annotated copy of the second draft of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Kassan draft, which begins with, and I quote, ignorance and contempt of human rights have been among the principal causes of the sufferings of humanity, end quote. And the first words of Article 1 are, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. In Europe, from the 1960s and through the 1980s, right-wing political parties like the National Front in the UK and in France campaigned vigorously against immigrants and immigration. But they remained largely confi confined to the edges of political life. It was the Austrian politician Jörg Haider who, starting in, in 1986, uh, set the alarm bells really ringing. Haider was telegenic and cast a broad appeal well beyond the diehard uh, xenophobes through his sharp, well-articulated rights, or sorry, well-articulated attacks on the freeloaders, the migrant communities. A hundred years after Karl Lueger, the populist mayor of Vienna, did the same against the Viennese jury, though perhaps with greater sophistication because with the exception of those hoping to emigrate to Vienna, the Jewish community in that city did not suffer directly under him at the time that horror came later. Isolate the grievance, pin the blame on a group, always, uh, almost always innocent, while taking care to do so uh, charismatically, and surprise, surprise, a political dividend emerges. When the liberal conservative uh, Wolfgang Schussel invited Haider's party, the FPÖ, into a coalition government in 1999, it sent shockwaves through Europe. Within a year, European sanctions were imposed on Haider's party, although if other Europeans felt no desire to see themselves sucked into the traumas of the past, the measures they slapped on Haider were weak and certainly not strong enough to stem this new momentum. For all his charisma, however, Haider alone couldn't change the face of Europe. He was still too extreme in his views. For Europe to go really dangerous, someone else was needed. If you were a thinking right-wing European chauvinistic nationalist in the mid-1990s, what you hoped for was someone less like uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen in France or Haider in Austria. What you wanted was a sort of celebrity, entertaining, flamboyant, and rich. And they did not have to be an extremist themselves, not at all. All they had to do was lay waste to those other load-bearing pillars of governance, a basic sense of order, propriety, and decency. And that would be enough. Enter stage right, Silvio Berlusconi. A billionaire who served a politics with chaos. While for years another party, the Italian uh, radical party, had specialized 
in being eclectic. It was Berlusconi's ownership of much of the popular media in Italy, control of the sort that the radical party uh, did not have, that elevated him above the rest. He flouted the rules and was revered for it in many quarters. Even before Schussel in Austria, Berlusconi had invited back into the heart of Europe its old nightmare, hatred. He had flung open the gate of government, first for the Northern League, a populist libertarian party in 1994, and then the Brothers of Italy, Italy's current ruling party in 2008. By doing so, Berlusconi guided shamelessness from the fringe to the center, and with the dismantling of memory, the memory of fascism in Italy in the 1920s and 30s, came the killing off of any corresponding sense of general alarm. The inflammation spread to other countries and quickly. Ignorance and contempt for human rights had been among the principal causes of human suffering. Meanwhile, elsewhere, following the brutal prosecution of the Second Chechen War, and in the West, the US-led intervention in Kosovo, Vladimir Putin was in no mood for, was in no mood for shilly shallying either, and once installed as the president of the Russian Federation, began cleaving power back to the vertical line, placing himself in time as master of all he surveyed. By the end of the first decade of the new millennium, Viktor Orban was also hard at work in Hungary with many others uh, similarly consolidating their power elsewhere. While uh, Karl Lueger in Vienna in the, late 19, in the late 1890s had pinpointed the downsides of the Industrial Revolution to refine his anti-Semitism, defending the little people whose corner stores were overrun by a new phenomenon, the department store financed, it was said, by Jewish-run banks, Orban a, century late, uh, Orban, a century later, combined two issues. Terrorism brought on by the likes of Al-Qaeda and later ISIS, an obvious threat to many in Europe and serious too, but one which was also manipulated. Strange as it may sound, the principal victim of international terrorism in those days, on a numerical basis, were Muslims in Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Somalia, and not Europeans or Americans. Nevertheless, Orban stoked the fears of Hungarians by wrapping, up, uh, by wrapping that threat up with migration flows into Europe and fine-tuning people's anxieties by bringing it all together in a hypothetical that billions of starving Africans and threatening Muslims would in time settle in Hungary, displacing the white Christians of the country, and all organized by George Soros. The overall pattern in the rise of leadership with an authoritarian past or a current inclination toward it was not the same everywhere. China was a principal be beneficiary of globalization, uh, but with it came corruption, or at least the public perception of it, which opened the space for China's leader, Xi Jinping, to purge the ranks of the Communist Party and strengthen his own vertical line, and by the 19th Party Congress, making himself unchallengeable. In the US, the moral majority and Jerry Falwell in the 1980s were, together with Roger Ailes, only waiting for a sort of Rupert Murdoch to supply them with what Berlusconi was beginning to have in the form of a media empire, while the money from a few prominent conservative families was already there. And as my former colleague Kate Gilmore points out eloquently, so was Phyllis uh, Schla uh, Schlafly, as well as the issue they could exploit the right to abortion. Exploit the tale of the decompression and a new compression begins. An American version of Berlusconi had only to step in. Almost all of it has to do with money and the political power required to make even more of it. What was brilliant about the way they did this was the way in which they exploited so skillfully every crisis that came along. Al-Qaeda, 9-11, the Iraq intervention in 2003, 
the banking crisis of 2008. While fully distracted elsewhere, Putin, for example, stepped into Georgia in 2008, and again in Ukraine in 2014. And again, what helped the authoritarian-minded greatly was the gold mine that was oversimplification, promoted so efficiently by a feather-brained social media industry, not realizing that oversimplification is also the favorite tool of the political extremists. So how does one break the compression of today? And break it we must, either we upset it, or we humanity are done. And from the expressions on your faces, I, I can see the second option is not the preferred outcome. If we could see five things happen, at least in part, it may be possible to avert the worst of it, uh, the worst of what could come. One, promote a decisive change from within. Two, vote and elect serious people, not entertainers and charlatans. Three, appoint proper leaders at a global level. Four, reinforce accountability, criminal and anti-corruption. And five, uphold human rights with consistency and clarity. To set the stage for the first point, I would like to draw on two of the foremost challenges we as humans face uh, first, zoonotic pathogens and climate change, two areas where we at the International Peace Institute are heavily engaged. For the past two weeks in Geneva, governments have been locked in negotiations capping a tortured two-year process of discussions on the creation of a new treaty designed to prevent the next pandemic of ever inflicting the sort of damage wrought by COVID-19. At the heart of the discussions lie two issues, the transfer of scientific know-how from high-income countries to the developing world, along with the application of time-bound waivers on intellectual property rights and a mechanism for access and benefit sharing. That is an organized system where a country affected by a pathogen of pandemic potential makes its samples and genetic sequence data, if it exists, instantly available to both the laboratory network and genetic sequence data centers respectively, all of which can then be accessed by the pharmaceutical industry in exchange for benefits derived from the creation of vaccines. In other words, the Global South is reminding the North, you often uh, generate massive prom uh, profits uh, when there is a public health emergency of international concern by way of our cooperation. And yet we, especially those of us in Africa, often see little to zero of those profits and generally feel exploited. And I've heard this myself many times. The big pharmaceutical companies, and by extension the governments representing them, have so far in the negotiations remained unmoved by these appeals. The manufacturers will in any case always secure through informal networks the information they need, and this is what they have been saying to us. The upshot seems to be, even when the globe is threatened, humanity is threatened, considerations of money will still come first and a more honorable path not taken. Turning to climate uh, change, the fossil fuel industry is similarly not willing to drop its fundamental opposition to a rapid phase out of fossil fuel use, still hoping to squeeze every drop of oil and every unit of natural gas before nature ends it for us all. In the negotiations on the decision text at the climate change conference in Dubai uh, last December, COP28, and notwithstanding the heavy lobbying by practically all of civil society for a rapid fossil fuel phase out, the language adopted in the decision text and found in paragraphs 28 to 30 was disappointing. Paragraph 28 began promisingly, however, with this language, and I quote, recognizes the need for a deep, rapid, and sustained reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in line with 1.5 degrees Celsius pathways. But what followed this were two destructive words, calls on, 
calls on governments to contribute to the following global efforts, and then eight paragraphs follow. In other words, the global community requested of itself and of its energy companies a certain number of things listed in those paragraphs, but only requested it. There is no obligatory language there. You know, <laughs> there is no you shall not do such and such, as is so often found in other international treaties, like the Torture Convention, where that language is absolute and uncompromising. In climate change, there was only calls on. We called on ourselves not to destroy our future. Well, how very polite and considerate of us. It is the same in the pandemic negotiations. So filled with, uh, was the draft text at the beginning of last week with caveats, it came across as virtually empty. Out of 83 draft paragraphs, only four had clear binding legal obligations and all four suited the pharmaceutical uh, industry. In 1936, Cecil Lewis referred in his classic book, Sagittarius Rising, to the invincibility of man's stupidity. What good is a bloated bank account when we and all our descendants are dead and humans are no more? Perhaps the most perfect business model history offers up was slavery. Everyone, everyone other than the slave and their families, obviously, was enjoying the benefits of it. Those who opposed were few in number and for the most part comprised the religious-minded and humanists, all of who found the whole money-making enterprise on the back of terrible cruelties disgusting. But to those making vast sums of money, these concerns were easily dismissed. Then in New York in the, in the 1830s, the Tappan brothers did something remarkable. Wealthy and influential, the two philanthropists turned against their class and became vocal abolitionists. The reaction was one of stunned disbelief and then rage. How could they betray their friends and their class? Friends who owed their privileges and status to the continuation of slavery. The Tappan brothers are no longer a household name, but when thought of, they can only inspire our admiration. The same thing cannot be said of their racist detractors. The present fossil fuel industry and pharmaceutical industry needs modern day Tappan brothers. Where are they? Is there no one with courage out there? And so too does the political world. Those who are authorita authoritarian by inclination, yet having the intelligence to recognize the folly of concentrating power to such absurd levels. For the time being, however, the trajectory, at least at a popular level, appears to be moving in the opposite direction. Every year, Freedom House reports on a number of democracies or the number of democracies and how it continues to shrink, along with the corresponding number of partial democracies and dictatorships numbers that continue to go up. More worrying is the given impression uh, that our publics have that non or lesser democracies get things done. Raymond uh, Atuguba of Ghana University Law School recently attended a class I was co-teaching at UPenn and pointed out the uh, troubling fact that the economies of those countries having recently experienced military takeovers seem to be performing better than their democratic counterparts in Africa. Elsewhere in Central, uh, Central America, the president of El Salvador, Nayib Bukele, is regarded a hero among those who are fed up with gang violence and insecurity in Central and South America. Even in this country, he's highly spoken of. So it usually is in the beginning. The calling card of the strong man or woman is one offering solutions. 
but when you breach contractual obligations or human rights norms to solve very real issues, usually the loss over time in the form of vanquished rights and protections outweigh whatever gain is felt in the present. And what exactly is it they are building? Security and, and better uh, economic numbers? Okay, we concede that. But only because, for the most part, they're taking shortcuts. Yet all of it without building stable institutions and respecting established norms. When I was still the UN Human Rights Chief, I attended a dinner while on a trip to a developing country hosted by a Minister of Justice. The head of military intelligence was also there, a man with an odious reputation who boasted he had files on all the political figures in the country using all the latest surveillance gadgetry the West was happy to supply him with. His idea was this, he would monitor every public official closely, never interrupting any wrongdoing or anything scandalous, building up the dossier until the state needed to bring the targeted official to heel or to commit them to something, and then the file would be brought out. This was said openly to me. How terribly ingenious. No, it's pathetic, really. Was this the proper way in which to build a country, build governance structures that would last? I asked him. To this, he had no response. Thus, for many non-democracies, 9-11 and the wave of Al-Qaeda-inspired attacks, which were horrendous, created an opportunity to extend the boundaries of what would have been an acceptable and a proportionate response. So much so, the resort to asymmetrical warfare in many countries meant the state soon became, like in Nietzsche's words, the very monster it was fighting. The use of surveillance techniques and the assertion of a security state mindset to fight violent extremism and terrorism was seldom able to regulate itself and the actions would often spill over to envelop civil society in an independent media and the political opposition, eventually the judiciary as well. And without the checks and balances the state must have in place to restrain executive power, quite a high percentage of the world's most visible authoritarians and their circles also happen to be among the richest individuals in their countries and it is often alleged the most corrupt, something the apologists for illiberal democracies seem to conveniently forget, and I'll return to this point shortly. The second point is elections and the critical importance of voting. It ought to matter a great deal for especially young people, even if they believe their vote counted for little. They must still vote. I won't dwell long on this point because after Brexit and the US elections in 2016 and 2020, it's a point made often enough by others and we saw what happened recently in Poland, a good news story. In Africa, as in other parts of the world, elections also need to be less money-driven and be welcoming to those with talent and not money alone. I also say this and I join many others in worrying about how the media continues to promote polemics, not just uh, social media in the crudest forms, but mainstream as well, and not limited to election campaigning only, as we well know. It all too often seems to revel in the tearing and sharing of society, almost to the point of enjoyment. Uh, fun, isn't it? Well, until it isn't. And global anarchy, uh, global anarchy will not be so much fun. Well, what then do we do if it is all too late? Or to quote uh, Julius Caesar, alia jocta est. That we are in the flow of some unalterable historical uh, cycle, Hegelian-like, spurred on by our avarice and moronic inability to recognize catastrophe when it's staring us in the face. And if the outcome is so predetermined and we are doomed, why not just embrace fatalism and party to the end? Roger that. Over and out. Well, we can't. Because, of course, it's never that simple or clear, nor are we that powerless. Kofi Annan, the former UN Secretary General, used to say to us, 
You can't be influential or consequential all the time, or even some of the time. Opportunities appear like shutters that open and close fleetingly, and when they open, try, he would urge, and act honorably and with some consequence. If we are indeed all facing colossal global challenges, even the smallest push or nudge there or here, here and there, the tiniest course corrections can be enough to throw off the, the, the or throw the trajectory off balance and it may just be enough. Which brings me to my third point, the importance of senior global appointments. Before I wade into a metaphor I often use, I'd like to refer to the issue of double standards. And we see this played out every day in the highly charged arguments over Gaza, with the US's almost blank check support of Israel, and the comparisons drawn by many governments around the world, especially in Africa and in the Arab world, with the US's denunciations of, or denunciation of Russia's attacks on Ukraine's civilian infrastructure. Now, of course, Russia attacked Ukraine, a sovereign state, and Israel was attacked by an extremist armed group, and the two are not the same. But what is also true is that civilians must be spared the ravages of bloodletting in both cases, else we surrender ourselves to the wickedness of absolute war. More generally, Western governments are especially accused by other states of being quick to condemn the dictators and the populists who are considered adversaries or enemies, and then excuse or be silent over those considered to be friends. And the critics are right, of course, but not totally. From my long experience with these matters, all states practice double standards, all of them. I saw it in Yemen and in Syria. The country's most vocal in their attacks on the, con on the conduct of the Syrian government were also some of the quietest when it came to the attacks inflicted on civilians in Yemen. And even as individuals, we must be watchful of this, including all human rights defenders, as Hafez warns us in his 10,000 Idiots. He wrote, it is always a danger to aspirants on the path when they begin to believe and act as if the 10,000 idiots who so long ruled and lived inside have all packed their bags and skipped town or died. While maintaining moral consistency and clarity is critical, so too is honesty and having a strong referee. Take any professional sporting league and ask yourself, where does power reside? Well, quite obviously, when thought of in monetary terms or popular reach, it lies with the franchise owners and the star players. That's where it lies. But for the sport to exist in any professional sense, you need rules and you need referees and officials that enforce them. Otherwise, it will become a sport akin to that played in the yard of a primary school. Yet, the referees and the officials are not known at a popular level, nor are they highly paid. The franchise owner may drive home in a Bentley and a star player in a Lamborghini, while the officials return home on the subway or a bus, but it is the latter who decides the points and awards the penalties. On them, the game depends. The United Nations is the repository of the larger, largest number of international treaties, including the core human rights treaties. These are the global rules, and the UN is, in effect, the custodian of them. The Secretary General, therefore, is, by logical extension, a sort of referee. If the referee is shy about blowing the whistle consistently when fouls occur, the game will eventually turn ugly. Similarly, if a specific uh, secretary general is appointed by a handful of players because those players know the former can be intimidated, easily intimidated, into not blowing the whistle when they themselves violate the rules, the effect is the same. Ultimately, the game is destroyed. 
in the context of international relations and the state of human rights, the situation is even more problematic because of the existence of the veto in the hands of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. Now, imagine a game of football when five of the players on the field can overrule any decision made by an official. Uh, the game can probably uh, still be played, sort of, but not indefinitely or with any sense of integrity. And that is our world today. The US, sorry, the US has used the veto 51 times since 1972. Many of the vetoes cast by the US, Russia, and China, which account for all of them now, with the UK and France ha hardly ever used, using them, occur when there are grounds for believing that atrocity crimes are being perpetrated. And if the Security Council is unable to respond, the agonies multiply and avoidable suffering continues. In those situations, our hope is that the courts will step in, and this is my fourth point. We must do all we can to back both the International Criminal Court, which currently exists, and the International Anti-Corruption Court, which is still in, in its design phase and needs to exist. First, the ICC. Its performance in the first 20 years of its existence has been inconsistent, and more can be demanded of it. It's hard to square the fact that it has exercised jurisdiction over Afghanistan for so many years and still there is not a single indictment when there are already four with respect to Russian leaders. How is that possible? That is not to say that Putin doesn't need to answer to the charges of the ICC, he certainly ought to, and maybe also eventually before an international court established for the crime of aggression with respect to Ukraine. But the ICC must remain consistent. And a word on Gaza and the ICC. We will soon see if the prosecutor will indeed issue indictments, as was reported widely in the press recently. The advantage of a criminal indictment is that it, it, it eschews uh, painting with a broad brush, uh, the tribalism, the labeling of people, their religion, and ethnicity. We have, ultimately, to be precise in our thinking and focus on the individuals who cause suffering. There is nothing wrong, far from it, for students here or elsewhere defending in nonviolent ways the families of the Israeli civilians attacked so brutally by Hamas on the 7th of October. Nor is there anything wrong for students to defend in nonviolent ways the Palestinian victims of the appalling assaults being authored by Israeli commanders on the civilian population of Gaza since the 7th of October, or defend the Palestinian civilians of the West Bank who since 1967 have been subject to the daily degradations of a military occupation now amounting to something like apartheid. It is individuals who cause avoidable death and injury, not peoples or religions, and those individuals must be brought to account. We also need an international anti-corruption court, remembering what I said about authoritarian leaders dismantling the checks and balances democracies provide, there, thereby permitting themselves easier access to ill-gotten gains. Judges Mark Wolf and Richard Goldstone have been campaigning for this, this court and focusing on a small number of countries that are the destinations for much of the illicit wealth. It is an initiative worthy of support. Finally, we should never underestimate the power of human rights themselves. Sadly, most colleges and universities in the US do not quite understand this yet, and uh, unlike UCLA, have failed to create human rights centers and those two words, human rights, hardly ever figure across broad swathes of academic work in the US or are rarely found in business literature. You would be forgiven for thinking if living in the US that human rights are unimportant or weak, simply not, not worth uh, studying. Are they weak? If so, why would a despot as apparent in too many parts of the world 
be so affected by the lone voice of a dissident, they can and often do feel compelled to silence it by imprisoning them, poisoning them, shooting them, or hanging them. Is it not because the so-called leader's own inadequacies and uh, question questionable legitimacy of their power is being highlighted and called into question, often with some justification? And can we not all agree there's nothing more powerful than when a truth comes from a single courageous voice defending the rights of all and threatening violence or harm to no one? Is that not something we all admire, a voice that is also so often willing to overcome the first hu of human instincts, personal survival, for the sake of defending a principle that has relevance to all humanity? The international human rights system and movement work uh, together like a thin film of oil spread over water, recalling Benjamin Franklin. It is a sinewy, adjustable, and difficult, uh, sorry, a sinewy, um, adjustable, and, and difficult to get rid of film. Yes, despots, authoritarian-minded leaders, populists, violent extremists, and many business interests will punch holes into it, even rip up parts of it, and they succeed for a time. Amazingly, however, it always reassembles and spreads even further. And perhaps that is why they are all so wary of it and why it is still a cause for optimism. But it comes with enormous sacrifices, which is why we must always acknowledge and pay tribute to the frontline human rights defenders the very reason we are all here for the Aurora Prize giving ceremony. Ultimately, if we are to break the current compression and jump high or laugh long as Hafez urges us to, we must think cleverly, reduce the whirling and night fighting and enjoy instead and together the glow of a tender moonlit experience. It has been my honor to address you today, and I'm grateful to the Aurora Humanitarian Initiative and to the Promise Institute for Human Rights at UCLA uh, School of Law for the invitation to deliver this uh, lecture. And I heartily congratulate all the nominees for the Aurora Prize, and I look forward to hearing who will be this year's laureates. Thank you so much.